Hey, this is Tracy Syed, and I play Brenda. Hi, this is Michelle Agresti, and I play Bia. All of us here at Arden would like to thank you so much for listening. We're so glad you found our show. What helps more people find our show are your reviews on Apple Podcasts. The more reviews, the more new listeners we can reach. But don't do it just for us. For every new review we get between now and October 31st, we will donate a dollar to RAIN, the anti-sexual violence organization. Help us find new listeners, help those poor, ardenless souls find us, and help an organization doing vital work. A win-win-win. This episode of Arden is brought to you by Oral Emoji. Oral Emoji, exactly what it sounds like. A product of Wayface Industries. The good people. Last time on Arden. Do you remember where you were when you found out that Julie Capsum was gone? Are horses pets? We can instead do the scholarly, professional look at Ralph and Julie's backstories. It was 2005. Every American movie was about 9-11. Including a wolf orgy. Julie was dying to go to UCLA. The 2006 Halloween party is where Julie and Ralph first collided. She walked away, but she did the look back. Julie had trouble making friends, but she had no problem finding interested boyfriends. corporations. Burn them all down! We remember that there were two victims here. Not one. Capsum case curse. Your case files are messier than your life, but without your charm. You know Ralph. He was unknowable. The question is, did Ralph and Julie actually go on a date? The answer is yes. I'm officially serving you a cease and desist. Welcome back to a new episode of Arden. Now, you may be surprised to hear that we're back after the threat of legal action last episode. But come on, guys. That was on tape. We had permission to air it. Of course we survived. As to how we survived? Well, I really have to do this? Legally, yes. I can't believe this was in the contract. You'd be amazed what was in the contract, and also slightly terrified. I'm going to need to read that contract. I would strongly advise you not to. There's provisions about that. Right. Well... We were saved by my boss, your hero and mine, the founder of Wayface Industries, the leader of the good people, Andy Wayface! Yes, the heroic efforts of... God, just play the tape. Because of course there's a tape. I don't know how there's a tape. Did they wire this whole station, or... Mr. Poins, surely there's a way that we can be reasonable? Your detective threw that out the window when she threatened to sick her billionaire boss on me. Guess what? I work for a rich man, too. I know how the game is played, Pamela. Here's how the game is played, Aaron. My boss is so rich that if he gets into a fight with the universe, he can and will just pay the universe to take a dive. That was supposed to be a threat, Ms. Bentley? (laughs) Because word of advice, have your threats make sense. The Capsum family has the legal ground here to demand the shutdown of this... All right. Where's the monster who made me have to spend time on the freeway? Five minutes. Five minutes of my day on the freeway. Do you know how much that cost me? It cost me five minutes of my life in traffic... Oh, it's you. Poins. How's your quoits game? Sir, I can assure you, I have never played quoits in my life. No, right. That's your cousin. He was telling me all about his lawyer cousin. That must be you, right? Said you were a real piece of... Hey, Brenda! Uh, Mr. Wayface, when I called your office, I thought they'd send your lawyers, not you. I was in town. So, what's the payoff? There's no payoff here, Mr. Wayface. I've delivered the legal order to stop this little show of yours, and now I have other business to attend- Barbecue sauce. The Capsum family- They're gonna stop my pal Brenda, who's been working on this for the last ten years, from finally figuring out what happened to their daughter. That's closure, man. My pal's gonna deliver it. This is her white whale pal, 
and she's going to harpoon it and mount it on her, her head on your... on the client's mantel, uh, mantelpiece? M- mantelpiece-ish. The Capsum family views your pal, Ms. Bentley, as a crank who is profiting off the tragic loss of their daughter. And And said tragic loss hasn't stopped them from selling the life rights to multiple studios or using it to pass laws they like. That's enough out of you, Ms. Bentley. And I... And you are going to go back up to their compound and tell them they can stick their lawsuit where the moon don't shine. That sun don't shine. It's... Really? Which one is the one hillbilly's drink? That's moonshine. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Hillbillies. Anyway, let me tell you how this is going to go. Because we're going to keep doing this show, and you're going to go in front of a judge, and let me tell you, I own every... This part we can't play on air. Yeah, very strict stipulations. You can't put them on air talking about... <laughs> or Mongo- but that's just... Fried noodles and eggs on a walk with chili oil. There was a whole thing with the government of Mongolia. We don't need to get into that. I find that strangely believable. It was quite a weekend. Still can't go near eep without, you know. Did you just go eep with your mouth just now? Like someone had censored you? Yeah. Unlike Andy, I can't afford the legal fines I've ever talked about. Well, the thing I can't talk about unless I can afford the legal fines. Do you know why your billionaire boss personally supervises all the ads for this show? Billionaire is putting it mildly. Still, one of the richest men in the world spends his days either recording radio ads or coaching people through radio ads? It's the personal touch. Well, I guess he has his priorities. Uh, So, long story short, we survived, lawsuit was dropped... And now we'll never speak of this again. Legally, we can't. On December 25th, 2007, somewhere around 11 p.m., Julie Capsum ran her car off the road and into a tree in the middle of Northern California's most desolate stretch of major highway, halfway between Eureka and Crescent City, California. One witness saw her pacing outside her car, but by the time the police arrived, she had vanished. While dogs picked up her scent headed into the trees, it disappeared in the middle of a forest clearing. What happened to Julie that Christmas night? How could someone that well-known vanish in the United States in the 2000s? And why has this case haunted us ever since? Each week, we'll explore a different part of the story and see if we can't untangle this web and find the answers. Join us, won't you? As we unravel the mystery on Arden. When their classmates said goodbye to Ralph Montgomery and Julie Capsum on Friday, December 22nd, 2007, no one thought that it would be the last time they would ever be seen at UCLA. In three days, it would be as though both of them had melted away into thin air. So, how did they spend their respective last days? We've heard about Julie's final ride, of course. So let's delve a little into that Friday and the last time anyone sees Ralph Montgomery. Winter break was finally starting, and everyone was flocking home for the holidays. While L.A. isn't exactly a town where you curl up by the fire with some hot chocolate and watch the snow fall, it's still a good place to blow off some steam. And by all accounts, Ralph needed to blow off some steam. Once again, Vince Bullio. His head was in a pretty dark place by that point, I think. Even at parties, he'd be hanging out in the corner, you know, not really talking to anybody. Would you say it seemed like he had something on his mind? No sh- Sherlock. Well, thank you for the comparison. Look, man, uh, sorry, miss. If you're trying to set me up to say something questionable about my friend, good f- luck. Maybe he just had a feeling he was going to finish the week dead in the trunk of a car. Thanks to Ralph's schedule, we have a little sense of what his last day was like. At least, the last day that we know he was alive. That morning, he was late for his final exam for climate change from puzzles to policy, having apparently skipped breakfast. Good call. Good call. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. 
unless it's college dining hall breakfast. Lousy food at your college? Everyone has lousy food at their college. Except for my Bowdoin-going brother. And he couldn't stop talking about those damn November lobster dinners. We get it. You're in Maine. I hate Bowdoin. Anyway, Ralph was late for this class. Joyce Portis, Ralph's professor. Ralph had been very enthusiastic about the course, I think. He'd uh, had some difficulty scrounging up the money for some of the field trips we took, but he'd still gone along on every one of them. But the last weeks, I recall him struggling to stay awake, getting a C for the first time. And a couple of days before this, he'd even fallen asleep in class. He seemed troubled. I wanted to sit down with him and hash things out, tell him... Enthusiasm only carries you so far if you can't do the work, young man. But it was Christmas, and I was inclined to be lenient. I felt I'd seen this sort of thing before, but we only had a quick chat. I made him promise to come to my office hours after the break, see if we couldn't put a pin in his recent activities, and that was that. I don't recall if I gave him any advice. I do remember wishing him a Merry Christmas, and the next time I saw him was on the 6 o'clock news. From Professor Portis's evidence, it certainly seems like Ralph didn't anticipate disappearing that night. Or he was just trying to get his teacher off his back. Wouldn't be the first student to do it, after all. True, come on. I don't recall if I gave him any advice. We've all had that, Professor. Seems kind of insufferable. Don't call a witness insufferable while we're recording. It's just tacky. So Ralph goes to his climate sciences test gets held back for a bit by his teacher. But despite what Professor Portis thinks, he's not entirely blowing off schoolwork. Or, at least, he's appearing to not blow it off. Because we know where he is during this time. Surveillance footage places Ralph at Powell Library on campus for about two hours, roughly between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Yes. In fact, we reviewed the footage as part of the initial investigation. And what were your conclusions at that time? Why, thank you for asking, Casely. Kindness does get you anywhere. Everywhere. Do you mess up sayings on purpose to be annoying? When the boot fits. The department thought the visit to the library was nothing. Just some last-minute cramming. But your conclusions were different. Of course they were. Both of his afternoon classes had essays as their finals for the term. Not tests. Which, per witnesses like Vince, Ralph had already written. And if he was working on his essay... He didn't sign on to any of the computers at Powell. He just sat in a study room with books. What books? Well, that's where it falls down, because he doesn't actually take out any books. Whatever he wants, he just copies down the information by hand, alone in the study room. And that's that. But we did find his fingerprints on a book of romance poetry a librarian reshelved for him. Romance as in the era? Or... As in love, Valentine's Day, flowers, boxes of chocolate... And I'm assuming that he doesn't have any poetry classes. You know he doesn't. If there's anyone who knows as much about this case as I do... Oh, please. No one, uh, has the perspective on this case. That you do. I want to say thank you, but also not. So his mind's on Julie. Wouldn't be the first time a teenage boy figured some grand romantic gesture like that wins back the girl. Which leaves him standing on the dorm lawn... In frigid February weather, in tights, in a Renaissance hat, and... Do go on. Was I saying something? Given that we're recording this, I do in fact have admissible proof that you were, in fact, saying something. Let's stay focused, Miss Benley. Well, my theory was that he was just trying to use poetry to get over Julie, but I'd much rather hear your oddly specific story. As you said, we're recording. You're no fun. I prefer to say I'm learning. Well, there's a first time for everything. Like you ever learn. I don't need to. Anyway, he's at the library for a couple of hours, and he writes down some stuff, maybe homework, maybe love poetry, maybe something else entirely. It's possible drug notes were hidden in the library books. Drug notes? Can't rule it out. We definitely found, actually, a lot of stuff hidden in the library. A lot of competition on campus. So that takes us to 1 p.m. And that's lunch. He goes to lunch, goes to his afternoon classes. Everyone, even Vince, says he seems troubled, edgy, argumentative. 
I remember he was really annoyed that they'd made enchiladas. He didn't like enchiladas? He loved enchiladas. Moving on. His afternoon classes... Attends both. Turns in the aforementioned papers in sophomore-level English Lit and sophomore-level biology. But each one has a final lecture before the holiday. His grades, again, descending in both. And that takes us to... 4 p.m. And here's where the theories begin. Because now we have a three-hour gap. Yeah, no one we interviewed was ever able to fill in where Ralph Montgomery was from approximately 4.10 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. on December 22, 2007. We do know a few things. We do know he didn't go back to his dorm. Which would have been my guess. 19-year-old, tired college boy vanishes for a couple of hours. He's probably taken a nap or otherwise, uh, relaxing. Though hopefully not the full three hours. Are we speculating on this now? Nope. Anyway, he doesn't go back to his dorm. He doesn't go to any of his friends' dorms. He doesn't go to the library or to any building on campus, so far as we know. He might have driven off campus, though probably not far. Traffic would have been kicking in. It's Friday night, and the people who are rushing home for Christmas are all trying to get out of town. UCLA is right by Sunset Boulevard, which would have completely shut down. Or it's close to the 405, which would have also shut down. But looking at his debit card, you didn't find any evidence that he'd made any purchases during that time, right? Not even stopping and buying gas. There are two working guesses as to what Ralph's doing. Which one do you favor? I know which one you do. That he's going to stalk Julie some more. It fits in with his pattern of behavior. That we've heard of. So now we can't trust what we've heard? What else do we have? I get it. The pieces are all there for the stalker narrative. But the fact that it was so aggressively pushed, especially by the Capsums, there was a clear agenda to brand Ralph as a stalker before we knew anything. It just stuck. Meanwhile, the police had their own suspect they tried to brand. We're not talking about that, and that's a mischaracterization. So where do you think he was going? Maybe he's... Gone to meet with someone in the drug trade, his supplier. Or he's just gone to get away from it all for a couple of hours. Think about it. He's known on campus as the guy who's just got his heart wrecked by an honest-to-God movie star. Pretty embarrassing, right? Then he's about to go home for two weeks and hear all about this relationship and how his grades are terrible, and he's letting the whole family down. Wouldn't you just want to get away from it all for a couple of hours? Find somewhere quiet to park and just chill out? The point is, we don't know. And the only reason those three hours look significant is because later that night, he vanished again. And this time, he didn't come back. It's like a coming attraction of the real deal. But this time, he did come back. Let's let Vince tell the story. We're all supposed to meet at Mark's dorm at 7. Ralph rolls up at 7.30-ish, and you know what? He'd seen trouble before. I mean, he goes off about enchiladas like that, but right now, he seemed calm. Like he'd been... Nah, 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 nah. Ralph didn't sample his own product. It was like, like natural calm. A before Julie calm. There were a bunch of last-minute parties on campus. We did the rounds. Ralph, he caught some for getting dumped by Julie, but he seemed relaxed about it. More than he'd been before. Just I just remember Mark. He's got a whole bottle of Jaeger. And he's drinking it over the course of the night. Mad, mad Mark. And we're in the park. And he's about a quarter of the way in telling Ralph to f*** every girl he meets that night and call Julie in the middle of it. And Ralph's laughing, you know. And then he goes, how do I even call Julie? My number's blocked. And both Mark and he thought that sh- was hilarious. We decide Mark needs food, which, let me tell you, his stomach overruled us all over my carpet. And we go to the school's late-night cafeteria, and we have chicken fingers and mozzarella sticks. And we just talk for like an hour. I mean, mean, Ralph and I talk. Mark was, uh, well, it was kind of like talking. Dude's so far gone, he can't tell the chicken fingers and mozz sticks apart. And we're all smiling, and it's... It's really nice. It's weird, but it's nice to have that as my last memory of Ralph. Talking about eating cheap junk food and smiling. 
And in less than a year, both of them were gone. I'm sorry, I, I don't remember more. People ask if he said anything important, but it's not like, oh, like in a movie, he said that one thing to solve the whole case, man. Uh, maybe he did. And I just forgot. But he was there, and he was there, and I remember feeling good, and I remember smiling, and that night he had us, and he knew he had us. I don't, I don't have anything more to say. At a little after midnight, Ralph helps Mark onto Vince's couch. Vince is going to look after Mark overnight, while Ralph is supposedly going back to his dorm. But instead, he stops at an ATM, and he clears out his whole bank account. Now, I don't mean to say he wipes out tens of thousands of dollars. This is not a rich kid, remember? But it's more than walking around money. The ATM camera's footage is grainy. It lasts less than a minute. You've probably seen it. But in it, he seems... determined. His jaw is set. His eyes are serious. There's nothing of the smile that Vince describes. To me, this seems like a man on a mission. Really? To me, he seems troubled. But determined or troubled. This is the last time anyone sees Ralph Montgomery. As though those missing three hours earlier that day were a dress rehearsal, he walks away from that ATM and it's like he evaporates into the darkness. He's here. And he's gone. Let's take a short break, and when we come back, we'll take you through whether or not Julie could have killed Ralph. Which, obviously, was... Oh, God. What? You're totally setting us up for a thing where I say yes, and you say no simultaneously, and then we shout at each other as we go into break. I wasn't setting us up! And the answer's no. The answer's yes. And why does nobody talk about this? The girl had a torso in her trunk! She's absolutely a suspect. No, she is not a suspect because it's impossible for her to have the time. Oh my god, to kill are you kidding me? Let's okay, take wait, that break, we promise, okay? Okay, Just, you know okay. what? Greeting. Who has time for it these days? That's why emojis are so popular. Instead of saying, that's great, you can send a smiley face. Instead of saying, that's sad, you can send a frowny face. And instead of. I'm horny. You can send an eggplant for some reason. Oh, come on. You totally know why. <laughs> it saves time writing it and time reading it. But what if you could do that with conversations? Introducing aural emoji. For a starter pack costing only $9.99, you can simplify all of your communications. Now everyone will be able to understand you, and you'll save valuable time. Instead of telling someone you're happy they got married... If you need to tell someone you're sorry they got fired... If you want Bay to come over and Netflix and chill... No longer will you fret about people misunderstanding you. Aural emoji removes all of those difficult to parse words and replaces it with pure emotion. It's a revolution in communication, not just a time saver, but a new way of understanding the world. Begin with the starter pack at $9.99, then choose from expansion packs such as Business Jargon, The World of Academia, or The Lingo of Love. <laughs> Aural Emoji, a new universal language. Brought to you by Wayface Industries, the good people. And we're back. Now, play nice, kitties. I can only listen to so many aural emoji ads in one day. Has it been all day? You know that abyss that stares back at you? I know what it sounds like. Anyways, 
It is absolutely possible for Julie Captain to have killed Ralph Montgomery because there are gaps of time where nobody knows where she was. It is impossible for Julie Captain to have killed Ralph Montgomery because there is no way she could have hid the body in her trunk for that long. It's known that she was holed up at the Capsum compound from Friday at 7 p.m. until Christmas when she takes her final drive. But there are still at least three times when she could have very well slipped out. But no single witness says she did do that. You know that. You helped the police take statements. Every witness was a Capsum family member, friend, or employee. And the Capsum party line is Ralph did it. Which, unless you know far more active dismembered torsos than I do, is not possible. Okay, so how'd she hide the body? If she kills him during the first time, 9 a.m. on Saturday, she drives out, she hides the body in the car, in her private garage. Someone would have noticed the smell. Air conditioned. Who air conditions a private garage? Rich people. And she's gone for about two hours. Plenty of time to meet up, do it, and get back. So where'd she do it? And why wasn't there any physical evidence? Maybe she cleans the garage, or he never leaves the trunk. For what it's worth, I don't think it was during the first time. Okay, what's the second time? Fundraising dinner. Get started at 6 p.m. on Sunday. Julie doesn't make an appearance until 9 p.m. Witnesses said it looked like she was shaken and had been crying. That gives her three hours, and she's obviously distressed. Like killing an ex distressed. But if it's a fundraising dinner, people are coming and going all the time. Surely someone would have noticed her. Or she slips out in the crowd. So how'd she get the body back unnoticed? Which is why I think it happens overnight on Christmas Eve. Everyone's asleep. She sneaks out. She does it. Because at some point, that torso ends up in Julie Capsum's trunk. Hold on. A Christmas Eve murder? This isn't the Kathleen Weir Capsum classic, Ho, 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 I Murder Santa. I'm just saying that there are literally hundreds of people on that compound between when Ralph disappears and Julie leaves. How do we not have one story that tells us she left? And how does no one notice any evidence that there's a torso in a nearby trunk? So then maybe she stops at the torso store while driving like a bat out of hell on her way out of L.A. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in a rush. I'll have my ex-boyfriend's torso to go, please. Or maybe it was planted by someone at one of these parties. Something like that makes more sense than, oh, I'm just going to butcher this guy while all my rich friends watch. That's not my argument, and you know it's not my argument. I'm just saying there are flaws. Oh, like your argument's perfect. Oh, like your You know what? I think it's time that we hear more about Oral Emoji. Oral Emoji. Liberate yourself from ever needing to read again. Oral Emoji. It's the sound of freedom. Oral Emoji. It's a gas, gas, gas. Oral Emoji. Well... There's really no words to describe it. And there shouldn't be. Oral Emoji. Brought to you by Wayface Industries. The good people. It was a hot, dry Christmas in Los Angeles the last time anyone saw Julie Capsum alive. Like most Christmases at the Capsum compound, it began rather late in the morning with a rather garish brunch. Rosalind... In between taking on Brenda's cases, which she really shouldn't be doing because she's not a licensed P.I. No, it's no problem. It's kind of fun, really. Is driving us along Julie's route up the coast. They let me buy a ton of Frappuccinos, so I am raring and ready to go. How goes the s***, Rosalind? Uh, well, I was following a and then stopped off at a cafe to get some croissants, where I saw It's not as a and, uh, well, long story short, the police have him now. Damn. Why don't we hear from Natalie for a moment? Can you tell me anything more about the Christmas party? Right. Well, it's a thing that happens every year. Or rather, did. The Capsums get all their family and friends there on the compound in Beverly Hills. And there's this huge, amazing brunch. Just, oh my god, ridiculous. Five courses, 
any kind of food you could want. When did you get there? Around 11-ish. Generally starts at 10, but it really starts at 11. You know, California time. So Julie's already pretty antsy, which isn't too much of a shock. I mean, you know what she was like. You know what her parents were like. She was clearly going to do a jailbreak that afternoon no matter what. So I figured we'll get through brunch, finish opening presents, and light out for Malibu or something. But then she gets the call, right? Um, yeah. You're not sure? I, I think so. Honestly, a lot of that day's a blur, you know? There's all these people you have to greet. It's just moments stay with you. Not everything does. I remember getting there. I remember the call, which has to have been not long after, given what the weirdo reported seeing her and all the other crap. But she was fidgety, antsy. And then she gets the call, and it's like, bam. She's just out of there. Did she seem like she was on anything? No. She wouldn't let her guard down around her parents. Wasn't even touching her champagne. The last time... The last time I saw her... She was jumping into her car wearing that gorgeous jacket Tyrell had given her, like she was making a break for it. And can you seem cool and frantic at the same time? Because, I don't know, she was clearly on about something. She was, she seemed primal, wild, but still cool just clung to her. And then she was gone. I left messages for her, called about three times, but honestly, it wasn't entirely out of character for her not to get back to me. At least, I didn't think it was at the time. <sighs> Who can blame her for wanting space? And that's it for Julie Capsum until Gerald sees her that night. And so, Julie drives from Beverly Hills to Eureka. As we've already said, that's a hell of a drive. 12 hours if you're pushing it. Julie pushes it, all right. She pushes it hard, because on the timeline we've got, Julie manages it in 11 hours. Spot her that there's no traffic in LA or the Bay Area due to the holiday. It's still a stretch. So the old alien hypothesis is looking great. Are you going to try to get aliens into every episode? What do you think she was listening to? You mean on the radio? Unless you think she had a panicked runaway mixtape. I don't know. Maybe she was listening to me on my radio station. That'd be pretty neat. Honestly, sounds pretty unlikely. Oh, come on. Don't be that way. Hey, I'm just saying. You brought it up. I'm just saying. I'm driving that long. I need to be listening to something or else I start to fall asleep. For the record, we're now four hours into the drive. Rosalind, how are you holding up? I'm a third frappuccino. I feel like I could recite I'm the very model of a modern major general while doing calculus. You're a saint. I'm the very model of a major general. Should we talk about the weather? Sure. We're doing this in pretty damn nice weather. Clear as the eye can see. Julie Capsum was decidedly not. Yeah. By the time she got about six hours out of L.A. and still plowing north, she's starting to run into some serious weather conditions. Rain, then snow is coming down, and California roads are not built for water in general, let alone snow. The least amount of rain on the road in L.A. panics at the shocking sight of this mysterious sky water. It's actually a real problem, but the roads get slicker than... You don't have a line for that? Not one I can say on the air. <laughs> it's a dirty line eyes on the road. You knew we were going to talk about the weather. And you didn't prepare a line? Did you want me to? No. I'm just surprised. It's been a long drive. But yes, anyway, the roads are getting dangerous. But she keeps the pedal to the metal. It's legitimately shocking she makes it as far as she does. Any way you slice it, Julie Capson was driving into a disaster that night. Was that profound? I didn't mean it to sound that way, but it kind of sounded profound. You want everything you say to sound profound. It's a life goal. What a 
about the blood, hmm? Well, it's just everyone talks about the torso, but didn't they find a lot of Julie's blood in the trunk? I mean, that's weird, right? A lot of blood. And it was only in the trunk. Yeah. It's pretty weird, all right. But let's not forget, she was injured. Probably disoriented. Well, it wasn't like she opened the trunk specifically to bleed into it. I mean, yeah, maybe she just cared about the interior of the car a lot. She is a rich kid. She cares about appearances. She's going through some stuff. Maybe she's, I don't know, I can store my blood in the trunk. But who thinks like that? Do you think like that? I definitely don't think like that. But maybe I should think like that. Come on. Eyes on the road. Uh, it's just... We've got someone to meet up there. I don't want to keep him waiting. Hello! B, good to see you. When you think of California, you probably don't think of the towns of Eureka and Crescent City. Plopped at the coast at the far northern end of the state, they're both former fishing and logging communities that would feel more at home in the Pacific Northwest than in a state known for white sand beaches. But when I took a job in Eureka, I quickly came to love it. It's a smaller town, only around 25,000 people who love their privacy. But like any good small town, it's got its oddballs and its quirks. Living there felt a little like living in a TV show. Yep, yep. It's a little weird living here, but folks look out for each other. This is my old boss. Wallace Wallace. Believe it or not, they're spelled differently. I was the Waves station manager when Julie Capsum disappeared. Retired now. Since Wallace was so invaluable to helping me out when I looked into this case the first time, he agreed to drive us up to where Julie's car was found. How long did the drive take you? Uh, twelve and a half hours. So we made pretty decent time in the end, thanks to our assistant. The assistant's in the back of the car? Yeah. We pulled up, she finished her 17th frappuccino, yelled that she could see through time, and then immediately face-planted into the horn. Good kid. This is it. It's a long stretch of highway, mostly straight, lined on all sides by tall redwoods. We're about an hour north of Eureka, in a section of the coastline where Highway 1 flirts with state park land at every turn. Nobody lives out here. There are a couple of vacation cabins, but on Christmas night, nobody would have been in them. And another half hour or so north is Crescent City. Crescent City is basically your last stop before Oregon. It's where you live if you want to be a Californian. But only a little bit. (laughs) In and of itself, Julie's car crashing up here shouldn't have been so remarkable. It was foggy, and there was a light mixture of sleet and snow in with the fog. She seemed to have simply missed a curve and plowed into a tree. It could happen to anyone in such bad weather. Yep, yep, it can snow up here. So where's the cabin? This way. We get a fair few people up here just for this, you know. People like you trying to solve the mystery. Fans of Julie and her mother. They put up shrines from time to time. Someone takes them down. Not sure who. Maybe the police. Maybe park rangers. What do the locals think? They don't. They got a couple of tourist shops in town that sell memorabilia. Just copies of Julie's films. Films were made about her, some cheap cash-in books. Didn't you write a book? For the record, if I did write a book or have written a book, it wouldn't be a cash-in. All right, there it is. Who owns it now? No idea. At this point, Brenda climbed up to the cabin, while Wallace and I moved to approximately where Julie's car crashed. It's a small building. One floor, maybe three, four rooms. A little older to be sure, but nice enough if you stock it well. Conveniently positioned with both road and off-road access. It was locked, and no one was home. But Brenda got up there and confirmed that, yes, from where the living room window was positioned, you could plausibly have seen Julie's car that night, depending on the fog and snow cover. The problem, however, remains tracks. Certainly, there was no one there by the time the police arrived, and there were no tracks leading to or from the cabin's door. It's almost as though someone had wiped it with a broom. 
as though someone had been prepared and just waiting for Julie Capsum to arrive. As though that call, and there was indeed a call, I've seen the records that prove it, that call was a signal. But a signal for what? So that's one mysterious witness who may or may not have seen what happened. Let's talk about the one we do know about. Right. She's seen by one old codger who used to live around here named Gerald Abernathy. Now, since it was Christmas night, so far as we know, he's the only person who drove by. But he did pull over to ask if she needed help. I should interject here to say that cell phone coverage up here is spotty in 2017, when we're recording this, so you can imagine how it was in 2007. Gerald's report of Julie's behavior is the first thing that sparks most people's interest in this case. Certainly reached out and grabbed me. I talked to him shortly after the police let him go. He said she was wild-eyed. He thought she might be drunk, but he couldn't smell anything on her. But when he tried to approach her, she swung on him with a tire iron. So Gerald leaves her alone, drives for a phone. That takes a half hour. And by then, per Gerald, the skunk ape has done its work. Ah, uh, yes. The skunk ape. It's what it sounds like. We'll get to more of Gerald next episode, but there is something very important that we need to tell our listeners now. When we made our plans to come up here, we specifically wanted to reach out to Gerald to hear his account, what stuck with him over the years. But... Gerald's vanished. Potentially another victim of the Capsum Case Curse. I love saying Capsum Case Curse, don't you? It does give me a chill. So yes, Gerald has vanished. No contact information. No one around here, and everyone at least knew him, knows where he went. It's like he, too, vanished off into the wild blue yonder alongside Julie and Ralph. So if you know where we can find Gerald Abernathy, please contact us as soon as possible. Anyways, Wallace, God love him, is getting up there. So he opted to wait by the car while Brenda and I proceed to the clearing. It's a two-mile walk. Beautiful. Peaceful. So, this is it. Looks a bit different from the first time I came here. No snow, for one thing. Someone's put a photo of Julie by the tree there. Unlike Candle, too. That's nice. The clearing is about maybe 300, 400 feet all around? Yeah. It's just about dusk now. And it's beautiful. No light pollution. The stars are overhead. Shining out at us in the dark, the deep and lovely dark of night. And maybe this view, this perfect night, maybe that's the last thing Julie Capsum ever saw. So the tracks got to about here. So it's the dead of night. Julie is injured, disoriented, punchy after the long drive. Most of us would just stay at the car. You're on the road. You can be found. You can take shelter. But Julie doesn't do that. She staggers off the road. And she's going fast, too. You can tell from how deep the tracks are. It's a power walk at minimum. Probably a jog. There's a little blood spatter on the snow, right? Yes. We get there with the dogs. We're pretty sure we're going to find a body. It's dark, as you can imagine. All twisted, gnarled trees at night. The kind of night that makes you believe in a skunk ape. And she's making a straight line, too. Whatever she's running from in L.A., she has one instinct. Get away. And she does. She's frantic. Wild. She would be, wouldn't she? Hmm. It's just a thought. Everyone who sees them in their last days described Ralph as troubled and Julie as wild. And I can't help but wonder if... I mean, you would know. Do you get uniformity of witnesses like that in cases? Sometimes. They're teenagers, both real heart-on-the-sleeve types. I just can't help but think that we're reading what happened into what happened before, you know? We expect kids like Ralph to be troubled. We expect starlets like Julie to be wild. People who run away like her to be wild. Because they were. And that's the story everyone expects. It's, 
it's confirmation bias. But maybe they were something more, too. Or something else. I just... We have to be missing something. Of course we're missing something, otherwise we'd have the answer. Huh. Uh, so, is this about it? Yeah. She gets to here, and nothing. Two deep tracks, like she's planted here for a while. A last little bit of blood splatter, and for all we know, two wings unfurled from Julie Capsum's back, and she's off into the night sky. Or aliens. Standing out here, you can see why I entertain the notion, at least. Maybe. Should we head into town? Yeah. We've seen all we can here for now. Just a sec. The picture's fallen over. Let me just put it back up. So now, we're up here in Eureka. I'd like to thank The Wave for letting us use their recording studio, as we're going to be sticking around for a couple of days to look into the police investigation and maybe get some answers about that phone call from the cabin. And it's gonna suck. What? Just trust me on this. It's gonna suck. So there you have it. Both Ralph Montgomery and Julie Capsum are gone. So what happened next? The answer is more complicated than you'd guess. That wraps it up for this episode. How are my two favorite investigators? Mr. Wayface? How the f***? What are you doing here? Well, I just bought this station, too. Brenda told me you used to work here, so I figured they must know what they're doing, and, well, I'm in the entertainment biz now. Hey, Brenda, what's tricks? I, uh... Good to see you. No, seriously. What's tricks? I heard people saying that exact phrase today, and did I miss out on some kind of slang? Right. Uh, well, thanks again for saving our hides. Remember that. You owe me one. (laughs) Anyways, you two have given me the bug, frankly, and now I must roam forth seeking the fabled state of mind that is Hollywood. What? Hollywood. You know, that mythical land of fame and fortune that we all seek. The pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The oldest folk tale in America. Hollywood! For I have ideas that shall change the face of entertainment as we know it. No. Hollywood is an actual place. In Los Angeles. No, it isn't. It's right by the 101 on Hollywood Boulevard. There's a big sign for it and everything. Honestly, it's kind of a lousy place, too. Literally everywhere around Hollywood is much, much nicer than actual Hollywood. Huh. Well, that is valuable information. All right, well, I better be off. I have some calls to make. A plane to catch, possibly someone who knows something about maps to either hire and or fire. Well, toodles. He took it well. Better than when I finally proved to him that kookaburras can't fly. What do you mean? Kookaburras can't... Kookaburras can't fly. It's very important that kookaburras cannot fly. Right. Of course. How silly of me. Kookaburras can't fly. Exactly. We could talk about this later. So, yes. The police investigation. The media frenzy. All this and more on the next episode of Arden. Thank you for listening to Arden. If you haven't bought your starter pack of oral emojis yet, you're a... Brought to you by Wayface Industries. The good people. Arden is created by Emily Vanderwerf, Christopher Dole, and Sarah Golub. This week's episode was written by those same three people. Our audio engineer is Elizabeth O'Bear. Our editor this week was Christina Holleran. 
Our cast is Michelle Agresti, Tracy Syed, Shannon Estabrook, Charlita Gaston, Benjamin Watts, Lindsay Zana, Robert Fleet, Lindsay Syme, Grant Patrizio, John Rail, Mia Drake. The score is by Christopher Hatfield. The logo is by Dylan Parr. If you're enjoying Arden, or even if you're not, and want to drive us from the face of the internet, there are two ways you can do that. You can rate, review, and subscribe to us wherever you found it. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, etc., etc. You can also look for us on Patreon, and you can toss us a couple of bucks there. That will get you access to special, exclusive episodes, other prizes, and all sorts of fun things. Tweet at us, ArdenPod, on Twitter. Our website is ardenpodcast.com. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr. You can come and talk to us there if you really want to. As always, our makeup and hairstyling were by Tracy Syed. Come back next week for more adventures in Arden. Thank you. Good night. Hi, this is Bea Casey from Arden, a Wayface radio program. Do you think you know what happened to Julie Capsum? What about Ralph Montgomery? If you have any theories or questions you'd like to ask me about, send us a message through our tip line on our website or tweet at us at ArdenPod on Twitter. I'm doing a Q&A in episode 6, and any theory or question you have about the case or the show may be addressed in the show if you send it in before October 10th. Remember, no theory is too outlandish. Not when I have to deal with Brenda all day. Rude.